Well, everyone, what a difference a week makes. We're in a new time. Hunkered down is what the governor has said we've got to do. Also, this idea of self-quarantining ourselves as we travel into the state of Alaska. Well, I thought about that about three weeks ago. If we would have done that, we probably would have limited a lot of the transmission of this disease, but we're doing it now, so let's enjoy it together. I hope that you're enduring your safe distance, you're washing your hands, you're keeping yourself protected, and uh, we certainly want to be looking out for our elderly. We know that this virus is definitely impacting them the most. But I thought it was really interesting. The, the city closes down the bars and the restaurants. It closes down travel. But guess what? You can still buy your pot whenever you're available. I just thought you guys would get a joke out of that. It's kind of interesting that we would do that as a city. But hey, that's just the way it is. But before we get started, I want you guys to realize this. It's time to vote. Make sure that you go out and you vote. I believe all Americans should always be practicing voting. It is a, a fundamental part of our country, and we want you to vote. Well, as you know, we are in this series on the grand narrative. It is a time in which God would use us in a mighty way by revealing his presence to us, and what does it look like? We've talked about what it looked like in the garden. We've talked about what it looks like in the fall. We've talked about what it looks like in a family. And that's kind of where we are. We're in season three. And so let's just tell you a little bit about the setting and where we are at. God's people, of course, are being mistreated as slaves. And uh, the male children are being killed. And, and, and Pharaoh is going crazy on these guys, creating them to do all kinds of ridiculous amounts of work in, in the slave trade. And so now we have this character, Moses, on the scene. He's coming in. He, he has met with God. He has stood before the bush, and he's had this encounter that says, hey, I want you to be my messenger and go back into Egypt and get my people. And that's where we are right now. Moses is on his way back. He's going to be having a little bit of a conversation with God to talk about who he is and the power of God, but that's where we are in the story right now. So the message today is this. Today we're going to see the presence of God displayed through the power of God. I believe at this time that we're going through in our country and in our world, we are all looking for the power of God. People are wondering whether God is or he isn't. They're wondering why God is not showing up and solving these problems. A lot of people are questioning God's goodness because of the people that are dying. I'm here to tell you today we can learn from this story that God's presence will be impacted, impactful. Have you ever had a moment? Have you ever wondered, where is God when you need him? Have you ever, have you ever had a moment like that in your life? I have had lots of moments like that. I'll never forget one of the moments that I had like that. I was swimming in a pool. I was in the sixth grade. I was enjoying PE class. It was the last hour of the day. And all of a sudden, I noticed the teacher come in and tell my teacher, PE teacher, hey, uh, I need you to tell Ron to go to the office. And I'll, I'll, I'll never forget this day. Uh, the teacher came to me and, and said, hey, you're needed in the office. And immediately what I thought back then was, man, I thought I was pretty good today. Matter of fact, I'm thinking, I cannot possibly be in trouble. I mean, I'm in trouble every day. I know pretty much when I'm going to get called to the office, which was every day but this day. And, <laughs> but the truth is, uh, I knew there was something different. There was something different about today. So as I'm going to the principal's office and getting ready to face the judgment, I notice uh, my Uncle Jess. He was actually my cousin. We called him Uncle Jess. He was in the room. And immediately, I could tell by the look on his face, something was different. Something was wrong. And I walk into the room and, and he starts to talk to me and he makes this comment. He says, there has been an accident. Now, if you know anything about my story, my uncle had already passed away. My mom had already passed away. My, my dad had already passed away. And so in my mind, I'm thinking, who else is left? What accident are we talking about? Was there a car accident? Was there a plane accident? There was a boat accident? I mean, these are big deals. He said, he looked at me and said, listen, your grandfather has had an accident on the spit at, in Homer and he has passed away. He died instantly. I remember at that moment thinking to myself, are you serious? 
Are you serious, God? After all that I've gone through, we're not done yet. How many more people are you going to take from me? I mean, I, I believe I started questioning all kinds of things. I'd say things like, hey, I can't afford to lose any more people. I, I thought I could trust you. I thought you loved orphans. I thought you looked out for me. I thought you were my protector. And I started to question who God was and what God was all about. I, I think that the, the conversation went probably something like this. Are you really real? Or is this all just a lie? Is there any truth to this story in the word of God? Is there any truth to the Bible? Or is this all just for fun and games? Because certainly I needed you, I need you right now to reveal yourself to me, to show yourself to me, to prove to me that you're God. Have you ever been there? Ever had those moments where you're saying, God, I need you to reveal yourself right now. And if you do, I'll believe. I need you to reveal yourself right now because I'm going through a time that I've never had before. I mean, I'm going through a hard time. Maybe you're impacted by this coronavirus and you're saying, listen, Lord, I need you to intervene right now. There's no question. All of us find ourselves thinking that at one time or another. Most of the times when we think like that, we, we say, God, if you'll, if, if you'll just reveal yourself, then I'll believe. And then I'll follow. Then I'll have faith. I'll stop questioning you and I'll start believing you if I can just see who you are. If you would just reveal yourself to me. But guess what? God has revealed himself to us. God has revealed himself to us and shown us everything about him. He reveals us in, in his eternal vastness. He, he reveals his name to us. He's revealed and demonstrated his power to us. He's revealed and shown his character to us, his compassion, his holiness, and his justice. Today, I want you to grasp one thought when it comes to this whole idea to help you put your mind around what God does and why God doesn't show himself and reveal himself to you, and that is this thought right here. Experiencing God's presence is not what transforms us. Let me say that again. Experiencing God's presence is not what transforms us. In other words, the experience is not life transforming. Most of us believe that if God would just show up, we would be transformed. If God would just reveal himself, we would be transformed. We would, our faith would be strengthened. We would never question God and everything would be okay. And I'm here to tell you something that's not true. You see, believing in God's presence is what transforms us. Not experiencing his presence, believing in his presence. And we're gonna see that played out in this sermon today, this passage. You see, it's not enough to experience his power. We must believe in his power. Here's the story. Moses is now asking God, hey, listen, how are the people going to believe me when I go down there? Who am I supposed to say has sent me? If you have your Bibles, let's turn to Exodus chapter 3 and verse 13, and let's pick up this part of the story. It's exciting. And Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? You shall say to them, and notice what he says, God said to Moses, I am who I am. Now, what an awkward statement. What do you, what do you mean you am who you am? I mean, I, I can see Moses now going, okay, God, that's interesting. And he said, say to the people of Israel, I am has sent you. I am. What is this idea of I am? What is I am has sent you? What does it mean I am has sent you? You see, when we think about this power, we have to believe something's very interesting. In other words, we have to believe that God is the final say. He is the end of the road. There is no other. He is infinity. He is never ending. He is powerful. He is all powerful, all knowing, and all present. And right now we find that the case of Christ, is God is saying, listen to me, I need you to go down to the children of Israel and I need you to tell them that I am has sent you. I am has sent you the power of God. But it's not just enough to think like that. It's not enough to know his name either. We must believe in his name and tell the world that he is the I am. For us to be transformed, believing means that we are going to take his name and tell the world who he is. He is the great 
I am. Let's jump to Exodus 3 and verse 15. Here we go. And God said to Moses, say to the people of Israel, here it is, the Lord, I want you to understand something. We put the word Lord in there in the English translation, but the word is Yahweh. So I want you to be thinking of Yahweh. We're going to speak Yahweh. That's the word. It says, the Lord Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is, listen to me, this is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. In other words, if if you're going to be my people, you need to understand something that I am and my name is Yahweh. And I need you to declare that forever and ever and ever. Wow. Wow. Think of what that means. Think of what it means for you and I to actually declare the name of the Lord, to not just have an experience with God, but be transformed enough that we declare his name forever. So why? Why should we do this? Why is this so important? Let me tell you why. Because many know his name. Many even fear his name. But only a few believe on the name of God, the name of Jesus, like we're going to find out in just a minute. We don't really know. The world doesn't know. The world goes through life and they think this and they think this about God. Matter of fact, most people just take the Lord's name in vain. They think nothing about it. But this story that we're about to get into is fascinating. The idea of the name of God, Yahweh. Know his name. Declare his name. Be transformed by his name. Later to be Jesus, the son of God. But here we go. We're going to pick it up in Exodus chapter five, but I want you to understand something. Pharaoh, when he gets the word that God is trying to get his people to be free, he, he has a little encounter and that's where we're gonna spend a little bit of time. You see, Pharaoh chose to completely disregard his name and in doing so, God is going to reveal himself to us and show the world his power. Now listen, I want you to grasp this. This is becoming one of the first times in which God comes down and has an encounter with men for hundreds. He's been, hasn't done it for hundreds of years. And now all of a sudden, God's going to come down and he's going to reveal himself to the children of Israel. He's going to reveal himself to the nation of Egypt. He's going to find himself saying, hey, listen, you're questioning me. I'm about to unload on you. Notice ex- Exodus chapter five and verse one. It says this, afterward, Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord. Now here's the message. Remember, God has said, Moses, you got to go. He got a little scared, said, hey, I want Aaron to come with me. Aaron and him are present. They're standing before Pharaoh and they, and they say this, thus says the Lord God of Israel, let my people go that they may hold a feast in the wilderness. Now, when I read that word feast, I think to myself, that is a Baptist mentality. I'll tell you what, we're going to gather together. I want to go worship God and we're going to throw a party. We're going to eat all the time. I don't know about you, but it seems like believers in Christ always love to get together and eat. And then it started right here. And then verse two, it says this, but Pharaoh said, I want you to think about this. But Pharaoh said the most scary words anyone could say, who is the Lord? In other words, Who is Yahweh that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? Wow. Who is Yahweh that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know Yahweh. I do not know the Lord. And moreover, I will not let Israel go. Here we have a confrontation between a man, a king, a king who believes he is God and God. And he's saying, listen, I don't know who your God is. I don't know this Yahweh. And I'm certainly not going to listen to him. And I'm certainly not going to let his people go. Can you imagine as parents, these moments always happen. Can you imagine your parents hearing this from a child? Hey mom, I don't know who you are, but I'm not listening to you. And I'm not going to do anything you say. We would be in shock. As a matter of fact, when we hear those words out of some kids sometimes, it blows my mind. We see it more and more prevalent today in society where kids look at adults and they're like, I don't know who you are, but you can't tell me what to do. And we want to do what God is about to do because we are so frustrated that somebody would defy the authority that we've been given as parents. 
or we've been given as leaders. I guarantee you, this is what God is about to do. Notice verse three, it says this, and then they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. This, the Aaron and Moses are like, listen, listen, Pharaoh, Pharaoh, the God of the Hebrews, their God, not your God, has met with us. And please let us go for three days. I mean, Moses is even being nice about it. Please, will you let our people go? We're just going to go worship for a few days. Please let us go into a journey, a journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord or sacrifice to Yahweh, our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence and sword. In other words, they're saying, hey, listen, please let us go so God doesn't take his wrath out on us. We, it's not even going to affect you. Just let us go. And yet Pharaoh changes his tune. And it doesn't change his tune. He says, listen, I'm not letting you go. And there is nothing that's going to happen that's going to make me let you go. Why? Because Pharaoh believed in his own gods more than he believed in the one true God. So because Pharaoh placed his gods above Yahweh, God is about to display an awesome source of his incredible power, the power that's found in the idea that I am and the power of the idea that he is Yahweh. He is the one, the creator, the only true God. And so God is about to unload. The description of God's power to each of us is that he wants us to know the real difference between God and fake gods. In our lives, we need to be thinking, what is it that we oftentimes do to God? And say, you know what, God, I hear you saying that, but I'm going to believe my God. And that's the story. That's the application we can take from this little piece. And that is this. How many other gods do we do that against Yahweh, against Jesus the Christ? How many times do we put everything else before him? Notice chapter 6, verse 1. God has a response. But the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. In other words, hey, listen, Pharaoh had his shining moment. He had his opportunity to obey. He had his opportunity to honor me. He had his opportunity, but I am about to stand up to him. And with a strong hand, he will send them out. And with a strong hand, he will drive them out. In other words, listen, when I'm done with Pharaoh, he's going to be begging you to leave. He's going to be begging you. You know, when sometimes it's pretty funny when, when we're young and we're, we're silly. I remember being a young boy and, and getting in an argument with my, my mom. And I said, you know what? I've had enough. I'm moving out. And my mom said, great. She grabbed a suitcase, she walked into the room and said, what would you like to take? And she starts packing up my stuff and, and, uh, and I'm like, I, yes, right. I can find a better place to live. And off I go with my suitcase about five steps outside the house and I realize, hmm, where do I go? How do I get food? How do I survive? It doesn't take long for us in those angry moments to speak out and say really stupid stuff to then eventually realize, okay, I'm not the God that I thought I was. I'm not there. I, I cannot sustain myself. And, and this is kind of where Pharaoh finds us, except the difference is he never wants to admit it. I mean, he's so full of pride and so full of arrogance that God is going to listen. He's going to wipe out all 10 of Pharaoh's small little g gods. In other words, God's going to go through and say, listen, I'm going to make a, such an example of Pharaoh that the entire world knows that I am God and there is no other God but me. It's going to be crystal clear. It's, it's going to be so evident that everyone is going to know it. And all of my people, Israel, they're going to see me for the God that I am. And they're going to respect me and they're going to follow me and they're going to obey me. And, and I'm just telling you right now, the idea behind this is that God is showing his presence. Kind of like when you and I are saying, God, I need you to show yourself to me. And if you show yourself to me, then I'll believe. Pharaoh didn't even want to hear that, but the children of Israel are certainly looking for this. They want to see God's presence show up. So what does God do? Well, let's just run through these. We're not going to look at the verses. We're just going to talk about them. The first God of Egypt is 
the God of the Nile. They worship the water. They worship the river. And what does he do? He turns the Nile into blood and says, you can worship this God, but I control the water. I control everything about it. Who is the goddess of fertility? And so God sends this plague of frogs. Why a plague of frogs addressing the God of fertility? Well, because the God of fertility had the face of a frog. Who is the God of the earth? Well, the God of the earth was the plague of lice from which the dust of the earth came. In other words, the lice came up through the dirt and contaminated everything. And who is the God of the earth or the creation? That was where the flies started coming in. And this was interesting because this God of creation, this idea that they worshiped the creation rather than creator, God sends these flies, it drives them crazy. But this The flies don't impact the children of Israel. They're not in their part of the land. They're only with the Egyptian. Then he does this. Who is the goddess of love and protection? And so God destroys them. He just kills all the livestock. You say, why does he kill the livestock when he's dealing with the goddess of love and protection? Well, because that goddess had the head of a cow. In which we will see later on that the children of Israel even turn to this goddess of protection when they are out in the wilderness and they find themselves away from God while Moses is up in Mount Sinai. So who is the goddess of medicine? This is the next God. And he sends a plague of boils and says, listen, you got no medicine. There's no health you can keep. I can destroy that God. And then what does he do? He does, hey, you have the goddess of the sky. Well, he sends hail from the sky and says, listen, you, you want to worship the sky? I'll send you something from the sky. And he starts to wipe out everything that's around, all their crops and everything they have. And then he says this, who is the God of storms and disorder? God sends the plague of locusts. And it brought utter chaos to the land. And then the last God was this, the 10th one. Who are you, Pharaoh? You foolish and selfish proclaimer that you are God. In other words, in that day, Pharaoh was looked at as a worshiper of God. He was the worshiped. He was one of the sons of supposedly the sun God, and he represented God himself. So here Pharaoh is, he thinks he's God. He's he's having a cocky moment. He's having a moment where he thinks he's got it all under control. He's telling uh, Moses and Aaron, hey, listen, I don't know who your God is and I'm not gonna listen because I have a list of 10 gods and what does do? God systematically, absolutely destroys every God that Pharaoh has to the point that he comes to the last one himself and says, listen, I'm the real God. I am the one true God, and because you will not worship me, you will not obey me, I'm going to take all of the firstborn sons in every family of the land of Egypt. Except, listen, except God made a way for the, for the Israelites to escape. He created the Passover. This idea in which innocent blood could be shed across the doorposts so that the death angel would walk past. And so the Israelites hear the proclamation from God that God is going to destroy all of the firstborn. And God gives a way for the Israelites to escape this. And all that do, listen, all the Israelites that put the blood across do not lose their sons they, they immediately, by doing so, acknowledge that they are not God, but that God is God. Yahweh is the one true God, but the Egyptians don't do so, and all of their sons are killed. All of their sons are wiped out. What a story. What an idea. This concept, this, this, this idea that somebody could defy God, and God says, listen, I'm going to reveal myself to you, and when I do... Fear and trembling is going to come upon you. That's exactly what has happened here. As you know the story, if you don't know the story, uh, Pharaoh is like, get out of my land. I need you to leave immediately. I need you to go. It was in the middle of the night. It was with haste. Get out of my land. I don't want to see you just like God had foretold. Israel was going to be let go and they were going to be given things and property and whatever they had to get them out of the land. And that was what had happened in the story. But the reason why we want to talk about the story is because this demonstrates God's power. It demonstrates that God knows how to back up his name. It demonstrates that he has justice and mercy. In other words, his justice is this, you do not have the authority to go against me. And his mercy is this, that if you would just obey me, if you would just listen, if you would just find yourself following me, I will protect you. Now listen, we would think that this presence that God displayed would transform Pharaoh. 
We would think in our minds that Pharaoh would have enough. In other words, just like we ask for God to show his presence, just like we ask God, please show up and reveal yourself to me. Pharaoh is living this moment where God has said, well, I'm going to show myself to you. And yet Pharaoh still struggles. How do we know that experiencing God's presence is not what transforms us? Believing in God is. Believing in his presence is what transforms us. Because despite this awesome display of power, Pharaoh wanted nothing to do with God. He wanted to kick the people of Israel out, but he wanted nothing to do with God. He was self-centered, self-absorbed, self-consumed. His life was all about him. When he went through the experience that he did, he turned his back even harder to the heart of God. His heart was hardened. Paul says this in Romans that, that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Think about this. Even our free will can occasionally be altered for God's glory and sovereign will to display his power. And that's exactly what God did here. God turned Pharaoh over to an obstinate and hard heart and said, listen, I'm going to show you. I'm going to give you a harder heart where you're never going to want to repent. But unfortunately, the story doesn't end here. Unfortunately, this story is not really ultimately about Pharaoh. And this story is really not about these plagues. This story, I believe, applies to you and I more than we want or want to imagine. It wasn't just Pharaoh who experienced God's power and didn't believe it. Many of God's people experienced God power, God's power here and failed to believe it. Let's jump to the other side, the other group of people, the children of Israel. Not only did they experience God's power, not only did they see all the plagues, not only did they witness God's incredible authority, his name, his power, the definition of what it means to say, I am. Man, they witnessed more than that. They witnessed after this time, the parting of the Red Sea. They witnessed Moses tapping a rock and water gushing out. They witness food coming from on high. They witness all these amazing things from God. And yet, what do they do? They continue to question who God is. In other words, the people we think that are in slavery, they're struggling in their life. They're at a down part. God reveals himself to them. He shows up and says, I am here. I am your God. I keep my covenants. I'm here to save you. They question who he is. Moses reveals to them who they, that he is. God reveals his power to them. Then he consistently shows his power throughout time, and yet his people choose not to follow him. This is an incredible story. This is an incredible story played out in history for you and for me. I truly believe it. Because I believe every time, like when I was a little boy, and I said, God, where are you? God's like, I've already showed you that that's not what you need. I've already showed you that you don't need me to reveal myself. You need to just know that I am God. You need to understand it's not an experience, it's believing. It's not an experience that transforms you. It's your faith. Think about this. Is it proof that even if God were to show you his presence today, if he answered every prayer, if he solved every problem, if he destroyed every virus, if he came down and even cured cancer, if he removed every heartache and if he healed, healed every relationship, if he sent his son to die on the cross for your sins, that those experiences still would not transform your life. In other words, the experience itself is not what transforms your life. It would still require you to believe. It would still require you to trust him to believe in his name, to believe in his power, to surrender to his will and to his way, to make him Yahweh, Lord of your life, or Jesus, the Christ, who was the Son of God. How do we know this is true? How do you and I, when we hear this story in the Old Testament, how do you know what I'm saying is true and that somehow this experience, this, this revelation of who God is, is not the answer to our problems? Yes, we want to read the story. Yes, we know it's true. Yes, we know it's history. Yes, we know it's there for a reason. But the reason it is there for you and for me is so that we understand it's not an experience 
that saves us. It's not God revealing his power that saves us because listen, God has already revealed his power. He created the universe. He created you and he created me. That's not enough. He comes down and he destroys Pharaoh. That's not enough. He parts the Red Sea. That's not enough. He brings manna from on high. That's not enough. He brings water from a rock. That's not enough. You see, no experience that you experience is going to make you believe it's going to be a decision from you in your heart. Let's just look real quickly and close with this idea. Let's look and see what Jesus said about this. He refers to this exact story in this way in which I'm sharing with you today. Notice Luke chapter 16 and verse 19. Let's pick up the story. It's between the rich man and Lazarus. It says this. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Think of that. This man is a beggar. He is under the table. He is down with the dogs. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. In other words, they even had priority. The poor man died and was carried by angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being tormented, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and saw Lazarus by his side. And he called out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger into water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received good things and Lazarus in like manner received bad things, but now he has comfort here and you are in anguish. Now notice what he says. And besides all this between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed. We cannot get from one side to the other in the order that those who pass from here to you may not be able and none may cross from here to us. In other words, when you die without Jesus, you go to hell. There is no way to get out. You cannot be restored back. Your life now is what matters. And in verse 27, he says this, and he said, then I beg you, Father, to send to my father's house. Send who? Send Lazarus to my father's house. In other words, raise Lazarus from the dead and have him go tell my, my brothers. And this is what he says, I have five brothers. So that he may warn them lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, notice this. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Notice verse 30. And he said, no father Abraham, but if someone goes from the dead, they will repent. Notice this in verse 31. He says this, and he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should raise from the dead. What is he saying? He's saying the experience that you're looking for from God is not the answer. It does not matter. It is not a belief in an experience. It is a belief in a God who is real. And this is what the story was about back in this time when God revealed his presence through the family of his power and he displayed it to Pharaoh and to all of Israel. He said, listen, I am God and yet the children of Israel even reject him when they witnessed it. And that witness is an example for us that says this, even if we saw God do a miracle, even if tomorrow he came down and cured all of the coronavirus, many would still not believe. It would not be enough for us. It would not transform who we are. See, God has demonstrated his power. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to this earth. And Jesus healed the sick. Jesus walked on water. Jesus calmed the storm. Jesus raised the dead. Jesus raised himself from the dead as a witness and a testimony Hundreds of years after this event, we see in Genesis to prove again, to give mankind another example of his power. And still, we do not desire to live. If you're here today, I'm here to tell you something. If you're listening on on the television or on social media, I want you to understand something today. You're not looking for an experience. You need to have an encounter with Jesus. 
You need to have a moment where Christ is someone you believe in. The Bible says this, if we confess with our mouth, in other words, it's not an experience. If we confess with our mouth the facts that have happened, we confess with our mouth that he is Lord and believe, believe, trust with all of our heart that he has risen from the dead. He has power over death. We shall be saved. You see, our experience with God has nothing to do with our relationship. It's not going to transform you. I need you to understand this. When we think of God's presence in this family, it's about our faith. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? Because only those who believe will be saved. You look at the children of Israel. God used those who believed. Moses believed. Abraham believed. Isaac believed. Joshua believed. And they lived a faithful life life. Well, listen, I want you to think about that. Do you believe in his name? Have you called upon the name of the Lord? I hope that you will today. I hope that you'll take this time to put your trust and faith in the name Yahweh, the son, Jesus, who can take away your sins and my sins. Because if we do, listen, if we believe this in his presence, in the presence of Christ, in the presence of God, we will love God and love others. We will share with others who he is. We will live a life with faithfulness and purpose. We will grow closer to him each day. We will serve our church, family, and our community. We will be generous people. We will not be hoarders. We will be standing out in this crisis that we have here in America and in the world. Are you a believer today? I pray for you so much. I beg you, I plead with you, put your faith in Jesus the Christ. Put your faith in the God of the universe, Yahweh, the I am, the great I am. Hey everybody, Pastor Ron here. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Here at ABT, we make a big deal about following Jesus. Make sure that you subscribe and hit our notification bell so that you don't miss any of our upcoming video content. Also, if you'd like to support this ministry, please click donate now. Thanks for watching.